I am so proud to welcome you all here today for this very important discussion. That's uh, for the decoding race talk. Over the past couple of quarters, the Race at Google team has invited national leaders, race experts, and external luminaries to guide us through many similar conversations on race and its intersections. We're, we're thrilled to bring the event today to Atlanta, uh, covering the most important topics of microaggressions and bringing our own selves to work. Personally, I'm really glad to see Google Tech taking this subject head on. Uh, I think what we can all learn by having the conversation, by carving out the time to be here, will help us at work and beyond, uh, and will enable us to be better to our peers and, and team members. Um, we have a great lineup for today, and I'm thrilled to welcome Fabiola Charles Stokes and Michael Skolnick to talk us through the agenda for today. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I learned a few lessons this morning that I want to share. First is, I live in New York City, um, in Brooklyn. Uh, I got up at 4 o'clock this morning, uh, and I cut my hair. Uh, and I was not expecting to speak today, but I'm glad I cut my hair, because I am going to speak today, at least I have a haircut. That's the first lesson, is you never know when they're going to call you to speak. Um, the second lesson is don't take a nap on the airplane. Uh, I never sleep on planes. And when I took a nap on the plane from New York to Atlanta this morning, I woke up and sadly two of our panelists had to cancel, um, one from New York and one from Atlanta. Um, the great news is Kimberly got on the plane from California. So the one who came the farthest didn't cancel. Um, so I am going to, I am going to, um, this one, this one, either one. Um, fantastic. I am going to um, lead us in discussion with Kimberly Papillon. Uh, today. Uh, sadly, Sean and Theron can, could not be with us today, uh, but uh, we are going to have an incredible discussion uh, on this topic. And our sincerest apologies for their cancellation. You now have me. My sincerest apologies for having me. Um, but we will have a really robust conversation and look forward to the, the uh, Q&A portion of the conversation so we can hear what you all have to say and your thoughts. Fabiola. Thank you, Michael. Luckily, we are all uh, really apt at thinking on our feet, so we managed to switch the format up just a little bit this morning so that we could ensure that we still had a very robust conversation and a dialogue with our esteemed panelists. So we are uh, moving the, the conversation event style from a panel into more of a fireside chat. Uh, we'll have our two esteemed thought leaders with us who will help to drive the conversation followed by what we hope will be a very robust Q&A from those Googlers that we have here with us in the room, as well as those on the live stream. So if you are watching from afar, please uh, log into the Dory. It's go slash uh, decoding race hyphen Dory and drop in any questions that you would like for us to share um, and have answered for you today. In addition, after today's conversation, please stay connected with us on this issue, um, as well as others uh, that are being led by the team by signing up for the Race at mailing list. So you can do those, all the uh, links for those are in the emails and the invite that was sent out for the meeting today. So in introducing our speakers for this morning, first we have with us Michael Skol Skolnick, whom we got to hear from a little bit uh, just before me. Uh, Michael is the CEO of Soze, a creative agency focused on social impact campaigns and triple bottom line companies, in addition to being a renowned movement builder, activist, storyteller, and proud father. He's a celebrated leader in the new social justice movement who, among other topics, <clears throat> excuse me, helped to ignite conversations around America's relationship with race, the death of Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, and Eric Garner, as well as the Obama presidency. He's a prolific voice on social media with more than a quarter million followers and a regular commentator on outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, NPR, and HLN. From 2009 to 2015, Michael served as president of globalgrind.com, a millennial-driven news website founded by Russell Simmons. And he currently serves on the board of directors for the Trayvon Martin Foundation, 
the Drug Policy Alliance, Revolutions Per Minute, The Gathering for Justice, and the Young Partners Board of the Public Theater. Earlier in, in his career, he spent over a decade as an award-winning film director and producer, and we are glad to have him with us here today. Our second speaker for this afternoon is Kimberly Papillon. Kimberly is a nationally recognized expert on medical, legal, and judicial decision making. She's served as regular faculty at the National Judicial College since 2005 and delivered over 400 lectures nationally and internationally on the implications of neuroscience, psychology, and implicit association in the analysis of decision making in the fields of medicine, business, education, and the justice system. If you think you're in for a treat, <laughs> this is going to be a really great conversation. Um, she has also lectured to judges in over 20 states, as well as the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, the United States Department of Justice, and the US Department of Education. She, uh, Kimberly is an attorney who previously served as a senior educator for the California Judicial Council as well as represented Fortune 500 companies, government entities, and tech startups. She has a BA degree from UC Berkeley and a JD from Columbia University School of Law. So please join me in a rousing welcome for our speakers today as they help to lead us through this really critical and important conversation. Um, thank you, Fabiola. For those kind introductions, I would, um, you want the mic, because this is just for the live stream, huh? Okay, so we can do the mic. Um, so thank you for those kind introductions. Uh, I would just give some quick context to this conversation. Uh, we have been brought on uh, to help curate these conversations uh, of the Decoding Race series. Uh, this is now, uh, I think, our 11th or 12th conversation that we've had in the series. Uh, and we're sort of beginning to dive deeper into the conversations on race. So this conversation is going to be focused around microaggressions and bringing your most authentic self to work uh, here at Google and folks who are watching around the country. And certainly for those who will see it on YouTube in a few weeks uh, for folks around the world. Uh, so um, if we don't get to a topic, race obviously is a massive topic, uh, a big conversation. Uh, a big challenge we face in this country and certainly around the world. Uh, if we don't get to a subject matter that you thought we should have talked about race, uh, we are trying to get to those in other conversations as well. Uh, we have one of the great experts uh, on this subject matter here with us today in Atlanta, uh, and we are going to have a phenomenal conversation. Um, I just um, came from Washington this past weekend uh, for the March for Science. Uh, and uh, I was um, the chair of the board of the organization that produced the Women's March. So the Gathering for Justice was founded by Harry Belafonte 10 years ago, uh, and I chair the board of that organization. And uh, that organization, we brought the Women's March into the organization, and then we organized. So Tamika, uh, Mallory, Carmen Perez, Linda Sarsour, Bob Bland, um, the four co-chairs of the march, three of them are part of our organization, and all three of them uh, have all spoken here at Google as part of the series. Uh, so um, I have now offered uh, our services for free to the other marches that are happening around this country, and the Science March um, had requested some help. Uh, so I was in Washington uh, for the March for Science. It was amazing to be around uh, so many scientists. And this conversation, uh, to really look at uh, the science of this, uh, how the brain operates, uh, how um, when we see someone or meet someone or hear someone's voice or see someone's name, what happens to our brain, and then how do we act upon that. So, uh, Kimberly, welcome. Thank you. Um, I know you took a few planes to get here, too. Yes, yes. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of, uh, of Google that I don't work for, I'm thanking you on behalf of all these beautiful people. <laughs> Um, we don't get any stock in the company, but we do get free lunch. Okay. Uh, so thank you. The lunch is always good at Google. So thank you for having both of us. Um, Kimberly, if you could just ground us for a moment uh, in this conversation. And we hear the term microaggression a lot, um, or we may not hear it at all. Some of us might know what it is. Some of us may, um, may not know what it is. Can you just ground us in sort of what is a microaggression, what, how does it play out, and, and, and then um, 
how, how do we recognize it? Uh, thank you. Um, microaggressions, uh, that term, racial microaggressions, was actually uh, coined by a man named Daryl Wing Su uh, from Columbia University. And, uh, but there's a way to understand it that I think is better than just reading a definition out of the book. Um, there's a really great example for microaggressions. Let's say you're standing next to someone who is much younger than you. Let's say you're uh, 20 years older than they are. And um, they, they're talking, you're talking to them, and they're saying, no, I, I'm trying to remember, and they say it's just on the tip of their tongue. They can't remember what they were about to say. It's just on the tip of their tongue. And a few minutes later, you forget what you were saying, and you say, I can't remember what it is, and they say, are you having a senior moment? And if, now, if you respond, you're the problem. And mm. that make, that's a microaggression where there's a little bit of an insult, a little bit of a statement that you find problematic, but if you respond, you're the problem. You think of the response in the car on the way home, you look in the rearview mirror at yourself and you say, if I had just said, that's, that's usually an indication that there was a microaggression afoot. Um, it's something that um, pokes at you and um, over a period of time can have a significant effect. So, so, so this place is very unique, as you all know. Um, you love VCs. You love Google Hangout. <laughs> I've been on many of them. Um, and so what I'd love to sort of walk through is in a place like Google, how we meet somebody. Um, from the very beginning, a new employee, a new colleague, a new person on your team, uh, you are spread out so far around the world and you work so closely with each other on other campuses uh, across the world um, that oftentimes, you know, you've never met each other in person. Oftentimes that you're working with a colleague in Mountain View or a colleague, you know, overseas and um, you only meet that person maybe once or twice a year. Uh, but Kimberly, walk us through when you hear someone's name. So for instance, um, you might, the, the first way you may meet someone is through a name. Um, the name on the top of an email, an announcement saying a new employee is coming to work, um, the, the participants in a conference call or a VC. Um, how, how does that name affect the way that we think? Well, before we go there all the way, I just want to mention that we're talking about unconscious processes. We're talking about things that go on inside of the brain that do not necessarily comport with our conscious value system. They do not match the way that we see ourselves. They do not align themselves with our goal set. They are unconscious. Scientists theorize that in a single second, the conscious components of the human brain can process 40 frames of information. In a single second, wow. the conscious components of the human brain can process 40 frames of information. In that same second, the unconscious components of the human brain can process 1.2 million frames of information. So who's really running the show? <laughs> and some scientists theorize that part of that 1.2 million in the background drives our decision making, and part of that 40 in the foreground is what we use to rationalize our decisions or make us feel better mm -hmm. about our decisions. Um, so we wanna try to figure out what's going on cold through that data in that 1.2 million. And um, what's in a name is a really good place to start. So let's say I put, um, I gave all of us laptop computers and I told you all, you're going to have an email conversation with a person in the room next door. Um, they're gonna share their math and verbal SAT scores with you. What might affect your ability to recall those scores once the conversation ends? Well, that's exactly what a group of folks at Harvard did. They took a group of undergrads and they put them in front of the computer and they said, you're gonna have an email conversation with a person in the room next door. And the person in the room next door is, a, uh, is, an undergrad, is actually a, an underpaid graduate student, let's assume. I know that's redundant. Um, but <laughs> they're, they're a graduate student. Let's assume they're given a script. So every single conversation is the same. You and I as the undergrads are gonna type in the questions, we're gonna send them to the person next door, the person next door is gonna have the same answers to those questions, so each and every conversation is the same. We need a variable. How about the email addresses? Some of the people are going to get the email address to reach the graduate student, they're gonna get the email address C-H-E-N, Chin, C-H-E-N, at wjh.harvard.edu, so basically Chin at Harvard. The other people are gonna get Amy, A-M-Y, at harvard.edu. Now, they don't know this is the variable. They think everybody has Chin or everybody has Amy. Conversation ensues, math and verbal SAT scores are shared, conversation ends, Proctor walks back into the room and says, do you recall the math and the verbal SAT scores that were shared with you? So, what do we think? So, let's say uh, the person at the email address Chin, do we think it's gonna be higher, lower, or the same? What do you think? Higher, what about Amy? Higher, lower, or the same? 
Lower? Okay, so that's right. So when people who use the email address chin, remember the math score is higher. One to seven points higher is our range. Okay? People who have the email address Amy, remember it lower. One to eight points lower is our range for Amy. What's going to happen with verbal? It flips. Mm. People with the, who use the email address chin, remember that individual scoring, lower, scoring lower, lower in verbal than what they were told. People with the email address Amy, remember that person scoring higher than what they were told. Now remember, the people who have the email address Amy, they bring the score down for math. Those are the same people that upgrade that person in verbal, and vice versa for chin. So, oh, there's something I forgot to tell you about this particular study. When each and every one of the undergrads walked into the room, before they typed a single key on the computer, they were all told the exact same thing. They were all told, you are about to have an email conversation with an Asian American woman by the name of Amy Chen. What do we do with that? Right? There's, there's this notion of what we call perfect information in this, this science called game theory, perfect information. What if you have perfect information? What if you know everything you need to know? What if you have the resume right in front of you with the person's experience and their schooling? What if you have um, the employee evaluations right, right in front of you? What if you have all the emails and the reports that person has read? What if you've watched them at work? Is it possible you can misremember some of the information? Not way off, just a little askew to change the way that you think about that individual. So this is the notion of having a template. I have a template for how somebody should perform, what their character might be, and um, what their skill set is. And then they demonstrate their skill set and they reveal their character, but I might morph that information to fit my template. And, and that's one of the concerns we have because that's just what's in a name. Where is that coming from? Um, from a number of places. So the hippocampus is the main part of the brain that gathers and stores data and information. Um, if we were talking about a computer, we would say data collection and data storage at the beginning of the process. Uh, so think of that data collection and data storage occurring in the brain in the hippocampus. And the possibility is that the implicit association, these unconscious thoughts, affect our ability to bring that data in and store it correctly because it doesn't fit our template. So someone could come in with great scores and perform very well, and we might recall their mistakes more clearly if they fit our template and fade out on some of these successes. Just downgrade them a little bit. Uh, I was giving a lecture um, uh, to a group of judges in D.C., and uh, one of them said, you know, you don't have to misremember every single fact. We couldn't have gotten to this point in our careers if we misremembered every single fact. You just have to misremember every tenth fact or every 15th fact, and not way off, just a little askew to change the trajectory of the complex decision-making process. Mm. In Google, people meet each other all the time, and so you have all of this data coming in. You don't have to skew each and every one of those pieces of data, just every 10th or 15th, and just a little bit off to change the overall impression you might have of that individual. So then that individual sends me, or gets on my calendar, because here at Google, they can go in your calendar to sign you up for a VC, right? So they sign you up for a VC and then you see their face. Talk to me about seeing someone's face for the first time and how that affects our decision making. So my favorite part of the brain is a part of the brain called the amygdala. Yes, I'm a big nerd to have a favorite part of the brain, but I want everyone to have a favorite part of their brain. So it's a part of the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is implicated in fear, threat, anxiety, and distrust. Fear, threat, anxiety, and distrust. They isolated the amygdala by sliding people into the machine and flashing pictures of spiders and snakes. And the amygdala lit up. So they can't keep doing these studies on the amygdala because they'll never get tenure if they just keep doing spiders and snakes, right? They've got to kick it up a notch. So they decide they're going to flash pictures of people's faces. Mm. They're going to flash a picture of a man of African descent and a man of European descent. And I'll use the short form, black and white and African American and Caucasian, but we don't know their nationality. We just know of African descent and of European descent. And they're flashing the pictures. And they're going to have to standardize the faces for parts of the face that make no difference as to how we tell who's of African and who's of European descent. Cheekbones, we don't use that. Forehead size, chin, that's not really dispositive in, in determining that. And they flash the pictures. They want to figure out who are they going to get more of an amygdala activation for. So what they find is something interesting. They get more of an amygdala activation for the African-American man's face than for the Caucasian man's face. Now there's probably a question burning in the room right now. Who was in the machine? Who was in the machine? So they put only Caucasian people in the machine who had been living in the United States for a full generation. So that's the information that they were able to gather from that. Um, but th what surprised them actually was that the level of amygdala activation 
match directly with people's scores on something called the implicit association test. So we can't all get our brain scanned, but we can all take the implicit association test online. And as people had more trouble on the test matching the idea of black and good with faces of people who were of African descent and words like love and pleasant and things like that, they were having more trouble making that match unconsciously. They would have more of an amygdala or spider snake-like activation when viewing the African-American man's face. They kicked that up a notch too, by the way. They took people with different levels of what we'll call Afrocentric facial features, including different, different what we'll call skin shades. Um, let me ask you a question. On a scale of one to nine, if I tell you that Shaquille O'Neal and um, Wesley Snipes are a nine on the Afrocentric facial feature range, and I tell you that President Obama is like a three on the Afrocentric facial feature, where would Denzel Washington fit on that scale, one to nine? Because he's big of it. Think so? Four or five. Wrong. Six. Ten. Denzel's always a ten. <laughs> <laughs> Are we correct about we have to we can't move on before we get unanimity on I told okay. you he's good. I was making I sure. On this scale, oh, but only a scale, he'll be like maybe a 5.5 .5 or a 6. Now let's take all the people who identify as African American off of that scale. Let's put people who identify as of European descent or Caucasian on that scale. We can have gradations there too, can't we? Um, as the skin becomes darker, as the nose becomes broader, starting from the top, as the lips become more full and the hair becomes curlier, we can have more a, a 1 to 9 scale if we put people of European descent only on that scale. There's variations there. Let's take them off. Let's put people who are Latino on that scale. Mm. Now we've got, we're back to almost where we would be with African American, right? Because the, we, we have to go country by country by country to be very specific. Um, we could put people um, who are Asian on that scale, couldn't we? Asian American or Asian, correct? And we'd have a lot of, a lot of um, leeway in terms of skin color, at least, on that, in that conversation, Pacific Islander, Native American as well. So what they found is that as they flash, in the United States, this is U.S. phenomena. A couple other countries deal with this as well. As they flashed pictures of people with darker skin, they were getting higher levels of amygdala activation, mm -hmm. and they were flashing pictures of people in different ethnic groups. So they were getting this reaction. So we can see that phenomena of the spider snake reaction happening, happening within other ethnic groups as well, um, uh, particularly when we look at, once again, Latino and Asian. We can see that occurring. Um, so this, this can manifest itself in a number of different ways. You see that face. So one thing, you know, one of the common sort of microaggressions that we, that we hear about and talk about is seeing an African-American woman and saying, can I touch your hair? Right? So seeing someone's, as a white person, can I touch your hair? Right? And there's books written about that. Right? <laughs> that one question, can I touch your hair? And there's that famous photograph of President Obama and the little boy um, when he first came into office. And the little boy asked President Obama, a, a young black boy asked President Obama, can I touch your hair? Because he couldn't believe the president had the same hair as him. Right? So just on appearance, how do microaggressions play out? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, imagine walking in first for the first time and meeting someone. You watch the way that they react. Um, do their eyes become big because they're surprised because your name didn't match the face? Mm. Um, perhaps they were able to um, see something that you had written and your, may, perhaps your title or what you had written didn't match the face again. And that surprise may not just be negative or positive, but it may be an indication to the person who's walking in that that person has a template. The person who's viewing them has a template. Um, but it could also happen in a meeting setting. Let's say I decide that I'm going to be um, particularly um, verbose. Let's say, or maybe I'm just going to participate in the meeting like anyone else. Let's say I'm just going to raise my hand when the time comes and to participate in the VC like anyone else. If you have a template of me as being more aggressive, then you may see my basic assertiveness and my contribution as being overkill. I'm oversharing. Um, let's say I give a great idea. Uh, I give a great idea 10 minutes into the meeting, and people say, that, that's wonderful, that's great, it's, but maybe it doesn't fit the template you have for me. 20 minutes later, someone else gives a similar idea, and they say, Michael, that was fantastic. You need to be the head of the subcommittee on that idea, because 
it seems like you could run with that because that fits the template that I have, once again, for the face or for the name. Um, the notion of the touching of the hair, there's a cultural competency conversation in there too. It may not be that I'm saying there's something negative when I say I wanna touch your hair, but the notion of you are so different, you are so, um, so novel to me, um, can be disquieting to the person who's saying, I wanna be part of the team. I, I love my culture, I, I value who I am, but I also want you to see me as part of this team and not someone so novel that you have to pet me. If that makes sense? You talked earlier today when I was speaking with you about the idea of dehumanizing somebody. Right? How, does, how does that land on somebody? That's really important. Um, so we do what's in a name. Uh, we see the name in the front. Then we see what's in a face on the VC. That's the first thing you're gonna see the face. And then what's in a voice. So we have a different reaction to a pleasant versus an unpleasant voice. Um, uh, I was teaching a group of judges in New York and I, they, they agreed that yes, uh, Fran Drescher of the nanny would, be con would constitute an unpleasant voice even for them. So that was, that was a, that even though that voice is familiar, it can be seen as unpleasant. And we can actually have a different brain reaction to that unpleasant voice. Um, but with voices, we also have an additional reaction. So what's in a name is the hippocampus, the memory, how do we collect data? What's in a face, the amygdala. Um, what's in a voice, um, we're looking at the caudate and the putamen. We're looking at what we call dehumanization, but should be termed as encoding is fully human. For me to see you as fully human, I need to see you as both warm and, and smart, nice and competent, and both of those things. Um, if I just see you as competent, I'm not encoding you in my brain as fully human. If I just see you as warm and empathetic, I'm not encoding you as fully human. So what we're finding is, if I let you listen to four separate voices, one is going to be, um, uh, they're all gonna be accented voices. Um, one is going to be a person with what they call the Anglo-American accent, and that's Nebraska folks. We require the Nebraska accent of all of our national male anchors for news. Uh, that not, not the women and not the local anchors but the national male anchors. So um, the, people will take classes to try to sound more Nebraska-like. Um, and so we've got that voice, then we'll get, um, we'll get a Harry Potter middle-income British, not Beatles British, not aristocratic British. Then we'll get a native Cantonese speaker, and then a native Span Spanish speaker from Mexico. And we're gonna let you listen to each of the voices. What will your brain do with the voices? Well, we find that Harry Potter, and, um, and I'll say Dan Rather, I believe he's from Texas, but he, sound, he sounded like he was from Nebraska when he took the desk. Um, we'll, we'll say that those two individuals clearly were encoded fully as warm and smart, as nice and comp competent on our human encoding skill. The native Cantonese speaker didn't score quite as well for warm, but for the native Spanish speaker from Mexico, they lost on both grounds, both warm and competent. So there are groups that we may be failing to encode in our brains as fully human on both skills. That'll reduce our empathy for them, that will change the way we allocate resources, and that will alter the way that we bring them into the team. The access they'll have to have full, um, a full contribution making power into that team. Can I say something, will it be heard, will it be valued? I, I, wanna, I wanna turn to the audience for a second. There's a lot of amazing things coming in. I, I don't wanna do a traditional just, you know, we speak Q&A. So I do wanna, if this, I wanna sort of take a, a moment to breathe and if there's any comments or thoughts or questions we have at this moment, I certainly would welcome them. So if anybody has any comments or questions or thoughts, um, the floor is yours. If not, I'll continue. But if you want to, please raise your hand and don't be shy. Um, and we'll come back to the audience. I'm going to come out there and, and do my Phil Donahue, my Dan Rather, but not my <laughs> Nebraska voice. So, um, so, so, so back to the voice. So, so, so you hear this voice. Right? You make judgment on this voice. Um, where does the microaggression come in? Um, let's say that um, your voice wasn't what I was expecting um, in a number of different respects. Let's say I say to you, um, oh, you speak English so well. Mm. And your response is, yeah, I'm from Cleveland. Right? <laughs> there shouldn't be a surprise here. But the notion that you are surprised or that I am surprised that you um, uh, are able to uh, navigate the English as well as you do, the English language as well as you do, is an indication that that wasn't my template for you. Um, let's and say- And there were, there were, there, there were um, 
conversations when Barack Obama was running for president, how articulate he was. Right? That Barack Obama was so articulate, even by Democrats, even by the man who became his vice president, um, used that during a debate that he is articulate, um, as if Barack Obama would be anything different than being articulate. So those ideas of judging someone by their use of language, the use of the English language, um, can, be, can lead to that microaggression. And watch how the microaggression works even in that respect. So each of those microaggressions were compliments. So if, mm. you, if I say to you, you're so articulate, and you then give me some kind of surprise negative response, then I say, what? I just gave you a compliment. What's the problem? Then I become the problem. You're the problem. You're playing the card, whatever mm. it might be. And so the notion inside of microaggressions is that there's, there's a subtlety to it. And the, the fact that you were surprised or that I was surprised that you were articulate was the insult or the aggression. But yes, it came in the form of a compliment. And so the person who's speaking it aloud doesn't believe that they're saying anything other. In fact, they may have been building up to finally want to say something really nice to you and that's the thing that they could think of and they tell you how articulate you are. So they're taken aback. Now what you have is a problem with um, perhaps some kind of discontinuity in the workplace because I opened up and tried to tell you something nice, and you gave back something that indicated that I had done something wrong. Now I would just want to shut down and not have the conversation anymore because I don't even know how to have, how to communicate with you. I, I don't know how to even give you a compliment. So the recognition that maybe I don't know everything there is to know about communication. Maybe I should step back for a moment and realize that some things may mean something different to one person versus another. And a good way to reflect on that is to think what might I find to be problematic when people have said it to me that I know other people say, no big deal, let it go. Uh, and that begins to build the empathy. Yes, there are things that are specific to certain people that perhaps are problematic for me to say because it makes it appear as if I'm surprised that they're doing that well, that they are um, that able to navigate English, that they're that articulate, those types of things. So, so let me ask a, a question, and we'll come back to, to meeting this new person. Um, I'm not an HR person, right? so, so I was a theater major, for full disclosure. Um, so, so we are not here to have an HR discussion. Right? Those are, are for other kinds of professionals who do HR work. When this conversation of microaggressions was proposed as part of the series, there were many folks at Google said, yes, this is the conversation we need to have. Folks are shaking their head in the audience, I won't look in that direction, but I see some head nods. This is the conversation we need to have. There are also folks at Google who say, we actually have a really healthy work environment here. I've heard words like family. I heard, heard words like this is home. Right? All across this, I've been to now 15 Google campuses. And I see an amazing camaraderie. I see some folks who I met who came from the data center. This is their second time here. Welcome back. <laughs> um, but there's, there, is, um, there is a sense of way in Google with pride. I'm a Googler. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a, a way to identify yourself. Um, but yet this conversation, oftentimes, and we're not trying to open the can of worms, but oftentimes gets shut down as being politically correct. And certainly in this last presidential election, those words were being thrown around. Oh, you're just, they're just being politically correct. Political correctness is the reason we have this problem. And then I hear oftentimes a criticism for me if you stop talking about race, racism will go away. But you're the problem because you're always talking about race. So how do we have these conversations in a healthy environment, but that are honest, and that if someone said, can I touch my hair, um, that might hurt me. And I don't understand, as you said, how that hurts that person how does that translate into a conversation that is productive? That makes a lot of sense. Um, political correctness is a term that I think you're right has been a bit demonized, and we can uh, we'll challenge Google to come up with a, a new term. Good idea. Um, I, I think that they're they're certainly able to do so. Um, I'll wait wait to see that news blast at any moment. Um, but I will say this: uh, microaggressions have health effects, long term and short term health effects, and there are a number of studies that show that. Long-term, um, what we call epigenetic health effects, 
changes in cortisol release, um, long-term um, chronic disease effects, so that people who are on the receiving end of microaggressions on constantly over and over again, because you can't really speak about them out loud, because you can't really um, voice them, and often you try to tell yourself to ignore them, they seem to have a physiologic effect on an individual's health. So it's not just simply, can we be more polite? Um, which fork do you pick up the kind of Emily Post type conversation? It really goes deeper than that. It goes to, do I feel as if I belong here? And, and, and how does that affect me as a person who's trying to work um, in an environment that I really love, where I really want to be productive and contribute to the team, which is part of the essence of the conversation at Google, in my opinion. So they've got a study that shows if you feel someone's treating you unfairly, a part of your brain called the insula activates. And the insula is the same part of the brain that turns on when you smell rotten garbage. That, that's an effect then, if I constantly believe I'm being treated unfairly, small or large incidents. Um, there's another study, study out of Stanford, and it kills me to say that. Go Bears. Um, so, so they take 10 people, put them all in a room, and they tell them, you're going to pass a ball around, one ball. And they say to nine of the 10, 10 people, don't give the ball to person number 10. No problem. Person number 10 has no idea what's going on. They pass the ball around and pass the ball around and pass the ball around. And then they take person number 10 and they scan their brain. And they find that person number 10 has the same brain reaction as if they'd been punched in the gut. Now that's different from getting punched in the arm. That's a pain conversation. But the part that's unique to getting punched in the gut, the anxiety, the helplessness, the panic, the fear, that is, that is unique to the gut punch getting the, the wind knocked out of you. So there are people walking around the workplace who feel like they can smell rotten garbage and they got punched in the gut. That's gonna really reduce productivity. That's beyond the idea of were we polite. That's the notion of, is someone having a neurophysiologic reaction mm. to being seen as other or less than? And can I touch your hair says other. And you are so articulate in a surprised way says less than. And in an organization that wants nothing but the best from all of their employees, nothing but, but the highest level of productivity and creativity at that, you really want to foster an environment where people feel when they walk in the door that they're there to belong. So, so I'm a white man, and I don't think I'm racist. And I think I have black friends, and I support Black History Month, and I voted for Barack Obama. But yet, I find myself in a meeting, if I take a step back, I find myself, oh, I'm judging you as a woman, or I'm judging you as a black man. And how do I find a solution for me as an individual in a workplace to not be the one who says, can I touch your hair? Uh, well, the, one of the first steps is to reduce what we call the level of moral credentialing. So I voted for... Barack Obama, I, um, I vote for President Obama, I, um, I have a, some of my best friends are, fill in the blank, whatever it might be. Those create a reaction called moral credentialing, which is kind of like the brain reaction that's akin to eating chocolate. I feel rewarded, and I reward myself, and whenever I come into a situation where I think I might mess up, I remind myself of the individuals who I've reached out to, the young person that I tutored at the school down the street, all those people. That gives me a better sense of I couldn't possibly have this implicit negative association in play. And that actually keeps me from doing the work that I need to do to undo that so-called unconscious bias. Because I tell myself it couldn't have affected me because some of my best, best friends are fill in the blank. That is actually a barrier to getting to a solution. Mm. And, and the reason we give it to ourselves is because people's value system is, I want to be fair. And when they see the specter of unfairness raised, they say, let me remind myself of how I'm definitely fair. I get that chocolate feeling. And now I can just go on with my day. Uh, so if we can remove the notion of needing to have the moral credentialing, saying it's okay, this is a human reaction. It's not okay if it manifests itself in a way that hurts people, but the fact that I have these templates, this is something that came into my mind when I was watching Saturday morning cartoons. In the 50s and the 60s, the accent given to the bad guy in most children's shows was Russian and German. You grew up during that time, Russian and German, that's the sound of the bad guy. In the 70s, we get aristocratic British as the mastermind bad guy, and African-American Ebonics. Ebonics is an antiquated term. Um, 
If you're listening to a voice and as you're listening to it, you can definitely tell that the person who was speaking is African-American or the rapper Eminem, either way, that's African-American Ebotics. Right? And, and then in, 19, in the 1980s, we add on a Latino accent and that there's multiple Latino accents, so mostly Colombian, Puerto Rican, Mexican-American. All right, those, those will be the three that we'll add in, and those are loose terms. Um, and, and we find that these become the villains. And, and we can look at all kinds of examples, including even the Lion King, where Scar is a lion on the African desert who was apparently educated at Oxford. And, and we're thinking, why is this lion who's the bad guy, but he's the mastermind bad guy. So we ha we're replete with these examples. Our brains are like heat-seeking missiles. We're looking for templates. And so if we can get past the guilt and stop dealing with the moral credentialing and move on to the solution, then we're on our way. And the solutions are based in the neuroscience too, of course. If I were to try, if I'm a manager and I'm sitting in a meeting and I wanna look at how many times certain people are being interrupted over others, I might not tell anybody, I might not, I'm not gonna point out which employees are doing the interrupting, I'm just gonna note who gets interrupted more frequently. And then afterwards I have a meeting, I say to everybody, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be watching whether or not we're letting people finish their thoughts mm. and whether or not we're encouraging people to share inside of that meeting. Well now, there's a part of my brain called the rostral interior cingulate cortex that's gonna turn on whenever I think I'm being monitored for race-related bias. My manager is not saying it's gonna be punitive, they're just saying, I'm paying attention to this, I want us to do better. Now, what if I start self-monitoring? I don't need my manager, right? I can self-monitor, I'm gonna note how frequently I interrupt one person versus another. As soon as I start noting it, my RACC turns on and I stop interrupting people, at least not as frequently one to the other. So the solutions are based in the neuroscience. What part of the brain do you need to turn on. When I give my lectures, I tell people, the thesis of the conversation is getting back control of your brain. Mm. If there's 1.2 million in the background that is guiding our decision making and it doesn't align with your value system, you need to get control of your brain back. So our first conversation that we had with, actually was on the panel with uh, Michael Eric Dyson and Melissa Harris Perry. We were in New York, I think Dory, you were there, um, and there was a young woman sitting in the front, a young African-American woman sitting in the front, and she had a T-shirt on, and the T-shirt had the names of victims of police brutality. And afterwards I said to her, um, do you feel comfortable wearing that T-shirt to work? And she says, I do, but I get asked a lot of questions. Like, what does that mean? Why are you wearing that? Who are those people? What do the names represent? So bringing your most authentic self to work, um, how do we do that with, and I'm saying we, me, me not being part of the we as a white male who is never judged with how I dress or what I have on my t-shirt, but how do we, for those who are judged or those who are asked questions, how do we bring our most, most authentic selves to work with pride and without fear of retribution or fear of punishment or fear of getting asked a question over and over again about your hair or about your t-shirt or about the way you speak or about the way your name is, how, do you, how, how can someone in this room or who's watching um, on the live stream bring their most authentic self to work and still feel like they can have a job the next day? <laughs> That's an excellent question uh, because we want that. If, if I feel comfortable, I'm more creative. Now, there's some places where we don't encourage creativity. I love that. Say that again. If I feel comfortable, I'm more creative. Mm. And, and in those places where we don't encourage creativity, then we can say perhaps bringing your authentic self to work isn't as much of a value in terms of the bottom line for the organization or the company. But if we're looking for creativity, if we're looking for innovation, um, doing that is difficult in a stressful environment. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it actually, when I have an amygdala activation, let's say I'm just scared of, of being myself, I have to constantly be on my P's and Q's. Um, an amygdala activation actually depletes the executive functioning of the brain. Mm. So we wanna be really careful to try to make people feel comfortable. Now we're not running Google Camp, right? But this isn't a place for everybody to learn how to play. Or not, right? <laughs> a little bit, right? Uh, we don't have to hold hands and sing kumbaya, but we do want to have a situation where people feel like, I can wear this, it is appropriate in the office, but I won't be judged negatively for it. Um, people might ask questions, and I can explain it and not feel as if I have to edit every single term that I use. And that's what we want. And how to get that going? Leadership. 
Mm. These kinds of conversations, saying that this is a, a, an important conversation for everyone to be having, and we want you to be comfortable having it. Number two, indictment goes down. We all have these various ideas in our heads. Let's try to work with them together. Number three, education. Uh, it, it's not a small thing, but learning about one another so you don't have to get your colleague who fits in a particular category to be the professor on all things Latino. Right? And, and suddenly they have to tell you all about all things Latino. And they're thinking, that, I don't think that's in my job description. So that distracts from what they would be doing that day. Um, it goes beyond the potluck. Um, but leadership saying we, we care about these things and putting mechanisms in place to make sure that the, that is part of the value system. There's software that Google can put in place to make sure that people are all getting a quote unquote fair opportunity for certain types of assignments. Um, there are um, images that can be put up inside of the workplace that demonstrate a certain value for equity that um, anyone can work this particular job and look at the different faces that are working in this particular job. Um, those types of conversations are powerful because they're the same things that imprinted us in the first place when we were children. Uh, these, these ideas of black, good, white, bad, this is not universal. This is learned behavior. We're not born this way. We come to it through images, through messages from all different portals. And so we have a way to unlearn it as well. I would love to turn to a leader in the audience who wants to ask a question. Um, I would also, this gentleman in the back with a beautiful um, shirt on. I love everyone's shirts today. <laughs> so uh, I think I gotta give you a microphone so our friends, oh you need to come, come on up, the price is right. Oh. Spin the wheel. <laughs> All right, thank you sir. Okay, so so several things you said bring up the same question in my mind, which is, if you're going to get control of your behavior, then you need to know what you should do. And many of these issues around microaggression, so for example, the example where, if you, where you need different assignments to different people, if you want to recognize someone, how do you avoid over, like you can overdo it, right? right. And that also makes someone feel like you're just patronizing them. Mm. And so how do you build the model for what you should do without sort of messing it up along the way? That is an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Um, so the first step in the 12-step program for solution is admit you have a problem. Mm. It just happened that way, right? Admit that implicit bias exists or unconscious bias or negative associations exist and that they affect your everyday decision making. That not, not implicit bias exists and you really need to talk to my colleagues. You're, we're not there yet. It's, it's implicit bias exists and it affects my everyday decision making. But number two in our 12-step program is take the test. Go on and take the implicit association test. As your attorney, I tell you not to print the results out and bring them back to your colleagues. This is for your own edification. But go online and take the test and see where your challenges might lie. They might not lie where you think. Google.com, Google what? All right, right. So you go implicit association test or IAT Harvard. Harvard wants to make sure they get their name in there. So they, uh, all right, so I, I, either one of those. And then you go on and you can go ahead and take the test and take multiple tests. Um, uh, take the sexual orientation test. Uh, take the weight test. Take the religion test. Take the gender science test. Do we have a difficulty um, with matching up the idea of woman with the hard sciences? So take those tests. There's a gender career test as well. Do female in career not match as well as male in career? Those conversations. So those are great tests to take. Then how can I actually look through and kind of monitor my own behavior? Is there a template? We don't necessarily want people to start creating scripts because that doesn't go for the flow of the workplace, but recognize that we might look at people differently and a good way to bring them into the circle is to do what we call making them our Bob. It's a study called Bob and Jim. So they're gonna bring you in a room, call your lawyer as soon as they bring you in the room because you know that there's a study's about to begin and you're gonna need some kind of you know, uh, forms to be signed off. So you, you walk into the room, they're gonna give you a picture of two people, Bob and Jim. Now Bob and Jim are both white men. Their eyes are equidistant from the center. Their, um, their, uh, their ears are the same in terms of how close they are to the head. Their expression is 180 degrees across, eyes, all of those things. They couldn't be brothers, but they might be cousins, Bob and Jim. And, and they're going to say underneath the, the picture of Bob and underneath the picture of Jim, they're going to put some stereotypes for you. So underneath the picture of Bob, they're going to say, Bob is from the Midwest. He's an evangelical Christian. He's a registered Republican, and he considers himself to be conservative. Got your stereotype for Bob? 
Mm. Okay, hold on to that. All right. Next, they've got Jim. Jim is from the East Coast. He's Christian, but not particularly regular in his religious practice. He's a registered Democrat. He considers himself to be liberal. Stereotype for Jim? Now, they don't care that they built the stereotypes. They care about what happens next. They want you to pick who you're more like, Bob or Jim. Doesn't matter who you pick. This is not about being conservative or liberal. It's about who's most like you. So let's say I pick Bob. Uh, now they're going to ask me deep, meaningful, sociopolitical questions about Bob, like, does Bob like Oreo cookies? Does Bob do his laundry once a week? Does Bob want to go home to see his family for Thanksgiving? Does Bob like to tell the truth? And when they ask me these questions, they scan my brain. And as I think about and judge Bob, they find that a part of my brain called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex lights up, the VMPFC lights up when I think about and judge Bob. Keep me in the machine, another round, they say, Professor. Um, oh, now we want to ask you the same questions in the same order, but this time about Jim. Does Jim like Oreo cookies? Does he like to tell the truth? And they find that my dorsal, not my ventral, but my dorsal medial PFC lights up when I think about and judge Jim, when I assess his habits, when I predict his preferences, when I analyze his character. A different part of my neuroanatomy lights up when I judge Jim, the person who I said is not like me. Now, if you said Jim was like you, then this reaction would happen for Bob. So once again, it's not about political proclivity. They keep me in the, they get a little more grant money. So they keep me in the machine one more time. And they say they're gonna ask me the same questions in the same order, but this time about myself. Do I like Oreo cookies? Do I like to tell the truth? And they find that my ventral, not my dorsal, but my ventral medial PFC, the same part of the brain that lit up for the person who was like me, lights up when I think about and judge myself. Have you ever made a mistake? Don't answer that question. When you, when you make mistakes, do you look in the mirror and say, I am evil to the core? I am beyond redemption. There is no state or county program that can help me now. No. You look in the mirror and you say, if I had more time, I would have done a better job. Mm. More resources, more training, more support. If the person who had gotten this project before me had not completely messed it up before they put it on my desk, I would have done a better job. That's the Bob reaction. That's the ventral medial prefrontal cortex working to let us give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And we lend it to our Bobs and not to our gyms. So one of the next parts in the solution set is to make people our Bobs to connect to people so that they'll, they may never get to our original Bob, but we will feel like they're more like us, and then we will be more comfortable having the conversations with them. And there's a lot of things that bring out the, in, in quick conversations, you can create some small amount of Bob reaction, dog versus cat people, team that you like, sports team that you like, hometown, things like that kick in. But for long-term relationships, integrated relationships where you're able to talk to people on the VC over and over again, you can build even more detail into that Bob template so that people, you're seeing them as more, quote unquote, like you. And you remove this notion of who's good and who's bad. Can I tell you one more solution to, to match with it? This, this one I love. They take a group of people and they give them the IAT, uh, a bias-related test ahead of time, then they have them play flag football. Then they give them the IAT afterwards and their race level of bias goes down. So what did they do? What they did is they had team A and team B, two different ethnic groups. And they took a person who was A and made them play on team B. Now that person has to cooperate and collaborate with people who are like them and compete against people who are, not, who, who are like them. So, let me, so cooperate and collaborate with people who are not like them and compete against people who are like them. Now what happens? they begin to remove that line between what's us and what's them. They don't lose their appreciation for their original team A, their culture, their background, their history. But they add on a new team. This is my team too. And that creates a different notion of me versus them, mm. us versus them, and it brings down your level of bias. Now, that means that you'd have to be the only person on that team that has that particular identity. It's not a bad exercise. It's not a bad thing to do in a virtual reality environment. It's not a bad thing to do in a, an actual play session that you would be able to put together. But that team building stuff that people think is so touchy feely, if it's made to, if it's mechanized so that it begins to affect the brain and the, these neural reactions, then we can actually create a different notion of who's us, who's them, and then we start to treat people the way we would want to be treated, as opposed to, gosh, you seem so interesting. Can I touch your hair? Mm. I think we have a question from Dory. 
Fabiola, is yes. that where you're going? Yes, that's right. where we're going. Going to Dory. Lots of great tips. And we're going to take a couple questions from the Dory. So the first of these the is... The Dory, by the way, just so you know, is folks around the country and the world yes, can yes. ask a question into some machine. So we'll look at the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first of these is, can you suggest tactful ways to respond to microaggressions that in the spirit that are in the spirit of a teachable moment. So with the goal of helping a person understand that they're making a microaggression and why they should not perhaps do that in the future or how they can change their behavior. That is best done in an environment where people are speaking the same language. So the nomenclature microaggression, if everyone knows what that means and everybody knows what implicit bias or implicit association is, and people know that this is an unconscious process, then when someone engages in a microaggression, you can say, now that might have been a little microaggressive and I know you didn't mean that, allow me to share something with you. You can't do that in an environment where people aren't speaking that same language because all they hear is you're calling me an ist, sex ist, race ist, age ist. So that's not the conversation we're having. We're having a conversation about unconscious thoughts. So getting everyone on board, having everyone not just learn about it in the surface way, but have it become part of the dialogue. And that's the feedback that I get back a lot. If I teach a group repeatedly, and with other individuals as well, who go back and teach groups repeatedly, um, they find that uh, they get feedback that a couple of months later, the conversation in their meetings has changed. They're more comfortable saying, now hold on a second. Was, was that a gender interruption? <laughs> that happens inside of the meeting. Let's think about that. Was there some implicit association there in our, in our assumption of who was more or less qualified as they're making hiring decisions? And it doesn't feel like an indictment. It feels like, okay, we're just including that in the analytical process of how we think. Mm. That's a safe space to be in. And with curious people like at Google and intelligent people who want to engage in that analytical process, adding an additional factor shouldn't be scary. It should be like, okay, now we've got more complexity. Now we're going to be more thorough. Mm -hmm. Great. Oops. Great. Um, so, so Michael has sat on, on, on stage with us today as an ally and has talked a lot about uh, his work in partnership with a number of organizations. Can you tell us a little bit about what some of the common misconceptions are of allies or others who, who really want to be helpful as a part of this dialogue and what you wish they knew to be able to mitigate against potential issues in the future and really become great partners as we kind of work together in that. So this is kind of both of you can. I would just tell one quick story. Um, I teach race to white teachers of how to teach their students about race. Most teachers in this country are white women and many of them teach children of color and, they, and, and in the moment that we're able to discuss this over some food earlier, um, the, the, the advent of what you all have created, right? these devices in everyone's pocket, and the communication change in this country in the past 10 years has brought the crises of race uh, in the immediate. So a child may come into school, and that morning someone might have been shot in his or her neighborhood, and they want to talk about it. And teachers are often not equipped to have those kinds of conversations, or there might be a big verdict over the weekend or a non-indictment, and there might be protests in the streets, and the child's parents might be in the protest, joining the protest, and they want to talk about it. So one exercise that we do um, with white teachers is um, when have you ever let down or not been there for a young black boy or girl? And we're teaching in a school in New York, and it's a private school. And we bring in teachers and administrators and people who work in the kitchen and all kinds of things. But they have to, it's all, it's a white affinity group. And we go around the room and everyone sort of expresses when they let down somebody who's a young black boy or girl. And this one man um, who happened to be in the IT department, he says, I hate this question. I'm not answering this question. This question is bull. I said, okay, pass the mic. I'm not going to answer the question. I'm not racist. My partner in my IT department is black. He's my best friend. And I'm not racist. I said, okay, pass the mic. Answer this question. Then he starts sobbing like a child, bawling like a baby. I said, what's going on? My whole life, I've used the excuse of not being racist. And I've never shown up. 
for young black boys and young black girls. I always thought I wasn't the problem, so I don't have to do the work. That moment for me, as an ally, made me want to dig deeper into the work amongst my white peers and my white colleagues and my white family. And how do we dig deeper into the work and show up? And so for the, those who are in the room today, um, proud of you to come to this, because we've been at many other campuses across um, Google, and it's not as racially diverse as this room, especially in other topics of conversation. But those, but after I'm proud of you, as your white ally, I also challenge you to go back to your spaces in this building and across town and data center, if you're coming from over there, and talk to your white colleagues of what you learned today. Or why they didn't come. Now some may have meetings or out of town or traveling, but some may be down the hallway having, or across the hallway having lunch. And this wasn't for them. So those are conversations as white allies and white people we have to have with each other. Oftentimes, I heard from many people during uh, the election, after Trump won um, the election, that they, did, they didn't want to go home for Thanksgiving. They didn't want to have the conversation with a family member who had voted for Trump. But those conversations, those courageous conversations, we have to have. And so for that question, where that question is coming from, as an ally, the first step for me is just showing up. And for many of you, this might be the first time you've been involved in a conversation like this, or this might be your 10,000th conversation, but you're here today and that matters. That matters in this building. Folks of color in this room see you. They may not know you, but they see you. They see me. They say, okay, maybe next week when I see that person in the cafeteria, I never met that person before, but I can start a conversation based on the shared experience we all had today. That was powerful. Um, I often say the most difficult people to teach fairness to are people who value fairness the most. I'll say it again. The most difficult people to teach fairness to are people who value fairness the most. Mm. If you really care about fairness, if you really care about equity, these types of conversations can be painful. These types of conversations can be disquieting. Um, to have someone, if we had, you know, the PowerPoint slides up and we're going through each of the studies one after the other, somebody prove to you in a rigorous fashion that implicit bias exists and that it affects your everyday decision making is not a comfortable place to be in if you value fairness. And so there's a rebound effect, this notion of I don't want to hear this because it's painful. The reason it's painful is because I value fairness so highly. Mm. So getting past that notion of yes, this is uncomfortable, but there is such extraordinary reward in doing the work. And it's not what works, works solely for the notion of someone else. That's what makes it hard. That's right. um, the notion of someone else, it's, a, it's not um, the idea of, you know, I'm going to build a home for someone else in a completely different environment, in a completely different community. I'll probably never drive by this home again. It feels good to have completed this structure and helped someone, but I probably won't even meet the person who moves into that home. It's not that. It's not that at Google. It's the notion of, I am going to change the way that I take in information. I am going to regain control of my own brain. Why? Because I don't want to undervalue innovation coming from one person versus another. That affects my ability to make good judgments and good decisions. I don't want to skip over ideas because they came from that voice as opposed to another voice. I don't want to discount talent because the name at the top of the email or the resume wasn't what I expected. That actually is not just affecting the bottom line, that's affecting my ability to do what I want to do. And if I want to not just build a better society, but I want to build a better workplace for me, then I want to join in that process. Um, you can have lots of friends of color. Um, we haven't found that having a, a one or two or even four or five friends who are of a different ethnicity lowers your level of implicit bias. What we find is that we make that, peop that person feel like they're one of us. We do a bob on them, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a good thing, but we want to do that in a more grand sense. But if we only do that for a few people, bring them in, um, what happens is we maintain our template for all of the people who are also part of that community. We just pull out an exception. You've heard somebody say, you're an honorary, fill in the blank. That means that they made you one of them, but forgot to change the template 
for what they have for the outside group. So that is the next step, bringing everybody in, it's the first, or I should say third step, but that next step is, let me change the template that I have for the outside group. That requires reading, that requires education, that requires recognizing that some of the things that we see, um, be it on the news, or reading in books, or a scene on television, may not be actual indications of truth. Two more, I wanna respect people's time, and it's the middle of the week, and um, a courageous Googler from Atlanta has a question. Somewhere in the audience, or we're going to go to the Dory. We have a, a, a woman here. Come on up. Thank you for your courage. Thank you. Hello. So my question is, how do we celebrate differences in diversity without, um, you know, creating like microaggressions and things like that. Like if we want to celebrate, if I tell someone, oh, your hair looks nice, or something like that, because it's different than what my hair is like or something, um, how do we celebrate those differences and have a culture of celebration of the diversity um, as opposed to microaggressions? Great question. Great question. Um, I think saying your hair is nice, um, I like that shirt, those types of things uh, aren't going to be seen as microaggressions. Um, once again, it's the, can I touch it because it's so different as opposed to I can appreciate it. So actually what you said was a celebration of the diversity. And, um, and I think number one, celebrating includes recognizing that we get more and more and more information about various individuals. People always use holidays as a way to celebrate it. We're gonna do something on Black History Month. But there is um, a more rigorous way to go about that. Um, celebrating um, individuals who have achieved in various areas of technology and business, um, giving some historical perspective. Um, it is definitely helpful to, for managers and supervisors to check and see, are they giving kudos on the same level to everybody across the board? Um, is everybody getting the same clapping at the end of the meeting? Um, is it being mentioned when somebody does a good job in each and every respect um, across the board? If, if we're not gonna mention certain kinds of achievement, we should not mention them for everyone. If we're gonna mention them, we should mention them for everyone across the board. But I think what goes beyond, celebration doesn't come first. Ce uh, genuine celebration that's helpful doesn't come first. Celebration that's helpful comes after understanding is in place and after the templates begin to be removed because then it truly is celebration instead of novelty. So your, your question is excellent, but we usually start with celebration and think that that's going to move into understanding. But what we're finding is that understanding needs to come first, which means we need to learn about one another, but we also need to monitor our own behavior. I might never know about people from Brooklyn. It may, it may never happen. I could still see you as, uh, I can encode you as fully human. I can take your ideas and give them value and weight across the board with equity if I am able to recognize that I might have a bias and I need to not morally credential myself and I need to recognize what makes you valuable. I don't need to know about your favorite holiday to get that right. Um, and if there's a culture and leadership has a culture of inclusion and says, we're gonna treat everybody the same in the meeting, I'm gonna monitor this process, I'm not necessarily being punitive, I'm saying that this is important because this is what drives innovation. This is part of the culture of this organization that we are about driving innovation and we cannot have innovation when people are stagnated. And so we've gotta make sure that those meetings have more meaning and, and that we're able to open them up so that everybody who is considered talented and assuming you wouldn't be here if you weren't talented, so that everybody's considered talented can actually contribute in a meaningful way. This has been incredible. You have a question? I do have a question. Oh, fantastic. Come on up. Thank you. I um, like your shoes. I'm going to change this. <laughs> there you go. They're comfortable. Um, I feel like, so we're talking about celebration, you, you know, oftentimes comes first, but, or I wonder sometimes, do we have to care first? Mm. Because, um, you know, I feel like some, when I look out in the audience, you know, we're preaching to the choir, you know, at a point. And sometimes I struggle with how do we expand the conversation but I don't think we can really truly do that if people don't care. So how do we get people to care a, a bit deeper? Um, number one for just for this group, and then I'm also wondering with Kimberly, you're spending time with judges, and you talked about those four things, I can't remember, competent, 
nice and exactly. et cetera. And it has to do with whether or not they care about a people and right. how they might impact synthesis and things like that. So I'm just, I'm just curious to know where does caring come into the picture, if at all? We think caring is linked um, primarily to the notion of empathy and helping behavior. And I like to also think that empathy comes after understanding. Mm. So um, there is a, a pain empathy reaction called cortical spinal inhibition. Cortical spinal inhibition. When, when you get hurt, a numbing sensation runs down to that area that got hurt. You don't think that it does, but it, it does. Otherwise, it would hurt much more. Um, but if I see somebody who I care about get hurt, I don't get the pain reaction, but I get the same numbing sensation to that part of the body where they were injured. And sometimes you can feel it. You get like a tingle up your spine in a, um, you know, in a, a, a horror movie, or you see a child fall down and hurt their knee, and you grab your knee and say, ouch, that, that must have hurt, those kinds of things. So what we're finding is that if people are looking at a hand that does not appear to look like their own, and we poke that hand with a hypodermic needle, um, they're having a cortical spinal inhibition for the hand that looks like their own, a pain empathy physiologic reaction we can measure, a lack of one for the hand that doesn't look like theirs, and a little bit of pain reaction among those who are considered Caucasian in the United States, we're finding they have a little bit of a pain reaction for the purple hand, the Barney hand, we like to call it. That needs to be studied more, the Barney phenomena. We're working on that one. Um, uh, but, but what's interesting is that if we can create an empathetic reaction for other individuals, then we can increase the caring. And what they found was if they put somebody's hand behind a little curtain and they put a little, a little um, monitor right above the hand and they show you a picture of a hand that doesn't look like yours, different skin color, and they slowly brush on the top of that hand in the movie or in the film, slowly brush it back and forth on the top with a brush. And then your hand is behind the curtain and somebody does the same thing to you in exactly the same rhythm with a brush you begin to lower your level of implicit bias. You begin to take on the notion of, oh, that's like my own hand. Mm. It changes that neural reaction. So it's different from just saying I wanna walk in someone's shoes. It's saying I'm going to figure out what it would be like to be them. I'm going to imagine what it would be like to be them. And that builds the caring and the empathy. But I can't make that decision to, to make that notion of, figuring out what it would be like to be them. I'm not gonna make that decision until I first has, have understanding that I need to do that. Because people wanna talk a lot about the solutions. You all have done a great done job here because you've been willing to identify the problems and the challenges first. Giving people solutions that they don't think they need doesn't make much difference. It, defining that there might be a need first and convincing people is essential to the conversation. And I, you all have done, I wanna say, an excellent job of really working on these pieces of the puzzle. I mean, not just in this one, but in all these conversations, it's a courageous thing to do. Um, Google's best place to also put things into action beyond the conversation. Um, bravo for this dialogue. What could be better as an initial step? But the technology that can be utilized and honed to change things, the access to individuals out there in the great beyond who can see various images, that's extraordinary power. Right. And what better place than this to have that happen? So I would say, in closing, um, I often find myself preaching to the choir, um, but I also know that the choir has to be fed. And I hope, we hope, that this session gave us some good food, some vegan treats, some healthy snacks, um, because you do have 20% that, as Kimberly alludes to, I have no idea who's in this room. I have no idea who's watching across the world. But I do know I go on Google 47 times a day. So whatever you all have created as a user, is working. And you have in genius and innovation and disruption in this company that allows you to take that 20% and do what you wish with that time. And someone in this room could be fed from this conversation to then go create something that could change the trajectory of my child's life. That's real talk. That's not like hyperbole. Like my child goes to the TV screen and does this on the TV screen. It, it's his device from another company that you do this with. <laughs> I won't mention. 
but he's four, and he thinks this is how you turn on the television. So already technology is implanted in his head how things work, and you all are creating that technology to change his life. So thank you to Google for this conversation, but most importantly, thank you to Kimberly for coming across the country and joining us and giving us that food and that health and that nourishment that we need so desperately during these times. Thank you all.